Good morning, Newbridge Church. Uh, Yes, so when Pastor Tim asked me weeks ago if I'd be willing to preach this morning, I uh, was praying that through, thinking that through, and God led me to a passage that is all about unity and conflict. And of course, I didn't know weeks ago that um, yesterday's events were going to unfold the way they did at that political rally in Pennsylvania, but the Lord knew. You don't have to be a news junkie to know that our nation and our world is seeped in conflict uh, and is not handling that conflict well. Uh, That is an understatement. But for those of us who follow Jesus, we are called to navigate conflict differently because Jesus is our peace. And Jesus has made peace with God possible, and Jesus has made peace between people possible. Even different people with different perspectives and different cultures and different come froms. And so I'm gonna just discard the other introduction that I had prepared and just jump right into the text. Are you with me? We're gonna be in Acts 15 today. Acts chapter 15. You're welcome to turn there, but it will also uh, appear on the screen or you can just listen in. The book of Acts is about what happened after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And to set this up a little bit, in Acts chapter 11, there is this paradigm shifting event of the apostle Peter preaching to Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman centurion, a Gentile. He was not a Jew. And Cornelius' entire household put their faith in Jesus. And then after that event, the gospel spread to places like the city of Antioch. The background of the slides that you see this morning are the ruins, what exists today, of ancient Antioch. The Antioch church included both Jewish background people and Gentile background people. And that church became a sending base. And they sent Barnabas, Paul, and John Mark out on what we now call Paul's first missionary journey. That journey was to spread the gospel and establish churches. Now, John Mark dropped out partway through that journey, and that's going to become important later. And there's a lot to unpack from that trip, but eventually Paul and Barnabas circle back to Antioch, and that is where we're picking up in Acts chapter 15. Spoiler alert, here's the big takeaway from the passage this morning. Chase unity for the sake of the gospel. Chase unity for the sake of of the gospel. Would you repeat after me, chase unity. unity. Yeah, chase unity. If you only remember one thing, that is what I want you to remember from this morning. Chase unity for the sake of the gospel. Unity honors our Lord who came to bring peace. And unity is a powerful testimony to those who don't yet know Christ. But it's not automatic. So we can't just think about it, consider it. We can't just wish for it. We have to chase it. Chase it. Okay, here we go. Acts 15, we're starting in verse 1. Certain individuals came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Now, this story was unfolding in the earliest days of the church when there was only one network of Christian churches. There was not yet a distinction between the Eastern Church and the Western Church, or the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, or the myriad of Protestant denominations and independent groups that we have now. There was only one network of Christian churches, and the headquarters for that network was in Jerusalem in Judea. 
The text tells us certain people came from Jerusalem and were teaching that these Gentile men must be circumcised to be saved. Now remember, in Antioch, the church is made up of Jewish background people. Those men would have been circumcised already, according to Jewish law and custom, but also Gentile people. And those Gentile men would not have been circumcised. And these teachers from Judea were not just saying circumcision's a good idea, it's a good way to live. They were saying, no, you must be circumcised to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas come into sharp dispute with them because Paul and Barnabas have been teaching that salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not by anything that people do. Now from our vantage point, looking back on this story, we might be tempted to oversimplify and say, these guys from Judea were obviously wrong to say that Gentiles needed to follow Jewish laws and customs, essentially become culturally Jewish before they could be saved. We might be tempted to say, how obvious, how unreasonable, how backwards. But to these individuals, this was about keeping the law that God had given. That same law is in my Bible and your Bible, our Bibles that we say are the inspired word of God. There are books in our Bible that instruct circumcision as part of a covenant relationship with God. So these people were not just pulling this idea out of the air. They were not just pulling it out of their culture. From their perspective, they were basing this on scripture. And there is a whole lot in Acts 15 that's really about how are we gonna view and interpret and apply scripture? And that's still a relevant issue for us today. And if I had time, I would nerd out on you a little bit and talk about how we're viewing and interpreting Acts 15, but we don't have time for that, sadly. I have to postpone my nerdiness for later. So the church in Antioch is presented with these two different teachings. They've got these individuals from Judea who say circumcision is necessary for salvation. Then we've got Paul and Barnabas who say it is not. And this church finds itself in a conflict. They do not just immediately split as a church. They do not automatically just break off from the network of churches that's headquartered in Jerusalem. Now, for that time, splitting or breaking off would probably be more difficult than it is for a lot of churches in our context today. But even so, I want you to notice that they did not do that. Instead, as they chase after unity, they actually make great effort to find a resolution. Make great effort, and that is our first cue. The text tells us in verse two, Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Let's think about how much effort that took. I don't know what process they used to choose and appoint some believers to go with them. That may have taken some effort. Once selected, this group made the journey from Antioch to Jerusalem. The trip was most likely made on foot. That is 300 miles. I read one source that said, well, at 20 miles a day, that's a minimum of 15 days. And I'm thinking, 20 miles a day? <laughs> one way. But then they probably added some stops for rest. And they may have added some stops for having these conversations along the way that are described. And then once they get to Jerusalem, the following events probably unfolded over some days. They didn't just go for one conversation or one meeting. And then they had to get back to Antioch. And how far was that? Another 300 miles. Weeks went by in the process. What was put on hold in the meantime? They made great effort to work this conflict out and to find a resolution. Great effort. And I submit to you today that 
far too often when there is conflict in a church or a denomination or even conflict between Christians, we can be too quick to opt out and go our own way before we've really made great effort to chase unity. And yet Paul says in Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Now that doesn't mean that we just cast our convictions aside for the sake of some kind of false unity. It also doesn't guarantee that even if we make great effort, others are gonna reciprocate and unity will be achieved. But for our part, as we chase unity, let's make great effort to get to a resolution and put in the time and put in the energy and the patience. Paul, Barnabas, and the other believers went up to Jerusalem to, it says, see the apostles and elders, which brings us to the second cue. Consult people who've been with Jesus. Not only did the apostles and elders have some official capacity as leaders, they were primarily people who had been with Jesus during his life on earth. Specifically, those who are going to be quoted in the conversation are Peter and James. Peter, we know, was not only one of the 12 disciples, he was also one of the inner circle of three that were with Jesus in really critical times. James was a younger brother of Jesus, another son of Mary, who may not have fully believed in Jesus as the Messiah before Jesus rose from the dead, but after Jesus rose from the dead, James was fully on board. <laughs> and he had certainly spent a lot of his life being near Jesus. So those from Antioch have come to those who have been close to Jesus to talk about the conflict. And I think there's something there for us to pay attention to. When conflict arises, it is wise to talk with those who've been close to Jesus. Talk with those who are officially in leadership, yes, and also potentially others who've known Jesus, followed Jesus for some time, have a track record of faithfulness to Jesus, who have developed the mind of Christ, so to speak. Now that doesn't mean that we just talk to anybody and we gossip about conflict. What it means is that a, a person is thinking of uh, taking off or a church is on the verge of a split. That's not a decision to be made in isolation. That is something to be discerned in community with godly, wise, mature people. Consult with people who've been with Jesus. Next cue is this, follow the spirit and the scripture. Follow the spirit and the scripture. Let's pick up in our text, we're in verse five. Then some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then... Why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Follow the Spirit and the scripture. First, it's Peter who highlights the work of Holy Spirit. 
He talks about how God gave the Holy Spirit to Gentiles. He references signs and wonders among the Gentiles. In other words, supernatural demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. And he's referring here in part to that conversion of Cornelius and his household which was followed by them demonstrating that they'd been given the Holy Spirit and one of the evidences was that they spoke in tongues. The men of Cornelius' household were uncircumcised, but that didn't stop them from being saved, receiving the Holy Spirit, and speaking in tongues. Peter is saying, I think that God has already weighed in on this issue of how Gentiles are saved. He's already showed us that salvation is not contingent on circumcision. The text goes on to say in verse 13, when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. So after Peter stands up and highlights the Holy Spirit, James stands up and highlights the scripture. He says in verse 15, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this. James is quoting Amos 9 from the Old Testament. It's about the rebuilding of David's tent or the tabernacle, the Jewish tabernacle. And and in, in place of the tabernacle, the raising up of a church as a new place of divine worship, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles as well. So James brings up the scripture. But I have a hunch that he was not the only one and this was not the only scripture that was brought up in this conversation. I suspect that some of those believers of Pharisaical Jewish background also brought up some scriptures about circumcision. And I would say that this speaks to the importance of understanding the whole counsel of scripture and how scripture informs scripture. I'd say that this speaks to a caution of taking some verses out of context, like a verse about circumcision, and magnifying that at the expense of understanding it in the context of the whole counsel of God. So the apostles and the elders listen to all that is said, and upon reflection, led by Peter and James, they pay attention to what Holy Spirit has done and they pay attention to what scripture says and this is gonna lead them to a possible resolution of this conflict. We too would do well to pay attention to what Holy Spirit is doing and to pay attention to scripture. This takes some discernment. This is a rich process And I'm grateful that we have those who've been with Jesus longer than we have to help us with this. Impromptu plug for foundations. If you want to understand better both how to hear Holy Spirit's voice, how to recognize what Holy Spirit is doing, and if you want to understand better the big arc of Scripture and how Scripture informs Scripture, sign up for foundations. It's phenomenal. Okay. So, as we chase unity for the sake of the gospel, make great effort, consult with those who've been with Jesus, follow Holy Spirit and scripture, and the last cue is, just keep it simple. Keep it simple. We're picking up in verse 19, it's still James talking, and he says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. 
Notice what is not on James's list. James is saying circumcision is not necessary for salvation and is not necessary to continue being part of the church. But there are some things that are associated with the worship of other gods that if stopped would help Jews and Gentiles get along peaceably in the church. These foods that are listed here were so repulsive to Jews that it was really difficult for them to look past it. So if the Gentiles would abstain from these foods, it would really open up the way for them to share meals together, for them to share table fellowship together as a church. In terms of sexual immorality, that was not only repulsive to the Jews, but we'll find in the rest of the New Testament that sexual ethics are relevant to all believers. Sexual ethics are not what produces salvation, but once we are saved, we are instructed to follow sexual ethics. So, Gentiles are asked to abstain from some things, but Jews are asked to let go of their insistence on circumcision. The list of instructions is short so that they do not make it difficult for the Gentiles. They keep it simple. There's a quote sometimes attributed to John Chrysostom, one of the early church fathers, and the quote goes something like this. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, charity. In all things, Jesus Christ. What this means is that in the most core central beliefs about the gospel, let's agree and have unity. And in the things that are not core, that are not uh, central, not essentials, let's give each other some room for differences. And in everything, let's honor Jesus in the way that we interact with each other when we're talking about these things, respectfully, generously. Now, most reasonable Christians would agree with this statement by John Chrysostom. Most would agree with this in general. The challenge comes in deciding what's in the non-essential category and what's in the essential category. In Acts 15, James is proposing that circumcision not be in the essential category. At the same time, he is proposing that these instructions about foods and about sexual immorality be in the essential category, not essential for achieving salvation, that's not how salvation works, but essential for clearly not worshiping other gods and having unity among the fellowship of believers. Now, in our denomination, in the Christian and Missionary Alliance, we are currently in a multi-year conversation about whether the order of events around the return of Jesus should stay in the essential category, right now it is, or whether that could go to the non-essential category. Do all Alliance pastors need to understand that in exactly the same way, or is there some room? That's a current example of this kind of dialogue about what's essential, what's non-essential. But let me tell you, I have seen denominations and churches and Christians in conflict over things much less heady than that. It's not always theological things or doctrinal things that we put in the essential bucket. Sometimes in a church, we debate whether a ministry philosophy or a style or a personality or a leadership decision or a political platform should end up in the essential bucket. I don't have an easy answer to all of this, but what I'm saying is that when possible, let's keep our list of essentials about the gospel. Let's keep that list short and simple and give each other room for differences and be forbearing with one another. And 
look for ways we can actually be enriched by each other's differences. Differences can not just be something to overcome. Differences can be something that give us a fuller, richer picture of who God is and what is the life that he has designed. That's a sermon for another time. Let's see how James's proposal plays out. Let me just summarize for you uh, verses 22 to, to 35. They send at least two leaders with Paul and Barnabas and the others back to Antioch, 300 miles, with a letter summarizing the conclusion. And in that letter, uh, the Jerusalem leaders say, here's what seemed good to the Holy Spirit and good to us. Abstain from these certain foods and from sexual immorality. The letter is very well received by the church in Antioch and the other churches that receive the letter. The gospel flourishes and verse 35 ends on a major chord. It is a victory. And then just before the curtain closes on Acts chapter 15, we have this very uncomfortable scene. Verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement, does that sound familiar at all? That they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of a Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the church. Wait, what? <laughs> You're telling me <laughs> that after they managed to find their way through this massive conflict that had all these implications and affected all these people. They got through it, they celebrated, and then Paul and Barnabas split over one guy? Did they not hear this sermon? Did they not follow these cues? Verse 41 ends on a minor chord, it's discord. So back in Acts 13, after Paul and Barnabas and John Mark set off on their first missionary journey, John Mark turned back, didn't go to all the cities. The text doesn't tell us why. But whatever the reason, Paul most definitely did not think it was okay. And so Paul is unwilling to take John Mark on a second trip. Barnabas wants to give him a chance. And they have a sharp disagreement and part ways. And I don't think that we can see this as intentional multiplication for the sake of the gospel. Now, our God is a master adjuster, so maybe God used it for multiplication of the gospel, <laughs> but I don't think that was the driving force over this split. The good news is that eventually the curtain opens again and the song continues, and we're not sure what happens between Acts 15 and 1 Corinthians, but by the time we get to 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is praising Barnabas. During Paul's first imprisonment, John Mark is included in Paul's group. He's with Paul. By the end of Paul's life, he came to admire John Mark so much that he asked him to come and be with him in his final days. John Mark evidently returned from his work with Barnabas, became associated with Peter, and is the author of the gospel of Mark. Listen, even when we end up parting ways over a conflict, we don't yet know what God will do. We don't yet know. Repeat after me, chase unity. Yeah, chase it. When we find ourselves facing conflict with a Christian brother or sister or a conflict in the church, we would do well to chase unity. Follow these cues. Make great effort. Consult with people who've been with Jesus. 
follow Holy Spirit and scripture and keep it simple. And when the relationship feels like it's left on a minor key, some of you right now are in situations and in relationships, the conflict is not resolved. It feels like discord, it's a minor chord. Hear me, God may not yet be done. God may not yet be done. I'd like for us to conclude with a very simple list of essentials known as the Apostles' Creed. Side note, in the Apostles' Creed, when you see the phrase Catholic Church and it's not capitalized, that means the worldwide church. And when you see the word saints, not capitalized, that means all the believers, all right? So I would invite you, as you are able to stand with me, and I'm gonna ask that in an attitude of <laughs> keeping our essentials list short and finding ourselves in unity around what is most important about the gospel, we could affirm this together. Join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.